All right, folks, so let's talk Measure for Measure Acts 3 and 4. Okay, so let's start off with Act 3. What's the recap? What happened here? Well, Claudio and Isabella in scene 1 uh, talk about Angela's proposition. The Duke, who's dressed up as a friar still, remember, don't forget that, tells Isabella about Mariana, and they hatch a plan to save Villa Isabella's soul. And then we have Act 3, scene 2. Here, it's the Duke meets Lucio again, who also puts his foot in his mouth again. Um, then the Duke, still dressed as a friar, asks Aeschylus, what he thinks of the Duke, okay? Um, so let's sort of break this down. As far as Act 3, Scene 1 goes, there's a couple of questions that I kind of want to talk about here. Um, the first one being, Claudio seems to be speaking as if he is noble at the beginning of his discussion with Isabella. Does he remain noble throughout this discussion? How does Isabella feel about Claudio's reaction? Do Claudio's reactions change when he speaks to the Duke, who's still dressed as a friar, um, who is Mariana, and how does the Duke suggest that Mariana can solve Isabella's problem? So let's break this down. Well, at the beginning, when Claudio is speaking with Isabella, at first, he seems incredulous. He seems like he can't believe that Angelo is such an awful human being uh, that he would proposition Isabella to uh, have her basically trade her body for Claudio's life. Uh, he actually says, oh, heavens, it cannot be. Right. Um, and then he tells her, thou shalt not do it. Right. Don't do this. This is not something you need to do. I don't expect you to do it. And then he starts to think about it a little bit. He's thinking, oh, wow, this is awful. I'm going to look at all these things that I'm going to be missing. Right. And, you know, the doubt starts to creep in. He gets a little bit fearful of death. Maybe he starts to mourn his loss of life. He tells her, death is a fearful thing. And at this point, Isabella's like, oh no, it's going to happen, right? Uh, you can kind of feel it. So after he muses a little bit more uh, in Acts 3, scene 1, lines 133 to 47, he begs Isabella. He says, sweet sister, let me live. What sin you do to save a brother's life, nature dispenses with the deed so far that it becomes a virtue. What kind of BS is that, honestly, right? He's trying to twist it around to make it something that is going to be valuable to Isabella's soul when she's just worried about this soul of hers. She wants to be a nun. She doesn't want to go and, um, you know, possibly uh, get pregnant with a child by Angelo and then be in the same situation as Claudio. Like, why would she want to do that? Um, but he asks her to, and, you know, Isabella gets a little cranky about this. I don't blame her. Do you blame her? Um, so let's see. So at first she is repulsed and disgusted. She tells him, oh, you beast, oh, faithless coward, oh, dishonest wretch. Wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? Right. So she's basically saying here, uh, I think the first part is pretty self-explanatory, but this, wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? Will you become whole again? Right? Will your life again be yours because of this sacrifice that I have to make? Okay, and, and, and I mean, that's a fair point, isn't it? And then she's incredulous. Might but my bending down reprieve thee from thy fate, it should proceed. I'll pray a thousand prayers for thy death, no word to save thee. Now, there's a little bit of play on words here with this might but my bending down, um, but She's saying, you know, basically, I'm not going to sleep with Angelo to let you live. That's not going to happen. If I could sacrifice my life for you, I would do that. But that's not the option here. Okay? So instead of doing this, instead of sacrificing my soul, I'm going to pray a thousand prayers for your death. Okay? I'm not going to save you. I'm just going to pray that you have a, uh, a successful death, that you go to heaven, okay? Um, and she kind of shows that she has moral high ground over all of Vienna, right? Because remember, everybody that we see has these sort of questionable sexual mores, um, everybody except for Aeschylus and the Duke, it seems, it seems. Uh, and she says, thy sin's not accidental, but a trade. Mercy to thee would prove itself a bod. 
So thy sin, Claudio's sin, um, his the fact that he slept with Juliet before they were married is not an accident, right? It's something that he did, which then caused this justice to be dispensed upon him. And she says, mercy to thee would prove itself abroad. So giving him mercy here, giving him clemency, letting him free would end up just reinstigating the same type of behavior and reinforcing that it's okay. Okay. Um, so she's, she's just really, you know, Isabel is a smart cookie. Uh, she is definitely someone who's able to use her rationale and her reasoning and her language to prove a point here. And so, you know, she says all of these things to Claudio and then the Duke who's been in hiding, right? He finally comes in and he just hammers the last bit home. Okay, uh, he validates Isabella's story, says, hey, yeah, I know that Angelo did this awful thing um, and tells Claudio, you know what, dude, you're going to die. That's what happens. And then Claudio finally, now that he speaks to the Duke, uh, still dressed as a friar. Right. So he's thinking that the Duke is dispensing some sort of moral, um, you know, excellent moral advice here. He says, let me seek or let me ask my sister pardon. I am so out of love with life that I will sue to be rid of it. So he's saying, I'm just done. OK, I'm going to ask for Isabella. I'm going to tell her I'm sorry. And I'm just done with all of this lifing. OK, um, I'm, I give up. That's basically what he says once he talks to the Duke. So is this ironic timing? Yeah, it is. It definitely is. It shows that he respects the friar, friar's opinion more so than he respects Isabella's opinion. Um, it shows us a lot of things about Claudio's character, that he values a man's opinion over his sister's opinion. Um, you know, it just says a lot. So who is Mariana? And how does the Duke, still as a friar, suggest that Mariana can solve Isabella's problem? Well, the Duke tells Isabella uh, that Mariana is, um, she, should this Angelo have married, was a fiance to her oath and the nuptial appointed, between which time of the contract and limit of the solemnity, her brother Frederick was wrecked at sea, having in that perished vessel the dowry of her sister, uh, of his sister, uh, lost a noble and Mariana lost a noble and renowned brother, the portion and sinew of her fortune, her marriage dowry with both her combined husband, this well-seeming Angelo. Okay, there's a lot happening in here. Basically, the Duke is telling Isabella that Mario, uh, Mariana and Angelo should have gotten married. They were pre-contracted, just like Juliet and Claudio. Uh, so just sort of notice how that similarity is there. But uh, before they were able to get married, her brother, Frederick, who was a noted sailor and soldier, um, was wrecked at sea with her dowry, with the money that was going to be used to, uh, you know, to, to give to Angelo for marrying Mariana. OK, that might sound weird if it's not something you're, you're un if, if it's not something you're familiar with. Uh, but that's not super strange in terms of what's happening uh, in the 1600s. OK, uh, so now not only in this case did Mariana lose her brother, um, she lost her fortune and then she lost her husband because Angelo walked out. He said, I'm not going to get the money. Uh, no. And so now, you know, this well-seeming Angelo uh, is now known at least in, in in terms of people who know about this situation, to be less well-seeming, wouldn't you say? And so the Duke decides, I have this great plan. So he said, he tells Isabella, we shall advise this wronged maid to stay, uh, set up your appointment with Angelo. Go in your place. If the encounter acknowledge itself hereafter, it may compel her to her recompense. And here, by this, is your brother saved, your honor untainted, the poor Mariana advantaged and the corrupt deputy scaled. So he says, okay, I have this great plan. So if we do this thing, technically it's going to be okay, right? Because they're pre-contracted and that she, Mariana, might get what she wants out of this because we know that she's still in love with Angelo. 
we see that the fact that Mariana is going to sleep with Angelo in Isabella's place might save Claudio's life because that was the trade, right? That was the deal. Um, Isabella gets to remain a virgin so she can go continue to be a nun and her soul is now safe. And then Angelo has to deal with the punishment for his crime. Everybody wins here. That's what the Duke is thinking. He's thinking, okay, my plan is brilliant. Everybody's going to win. Uh, Angelo is going to be outed as, you know, this sort of awful human being um, to the people that matter, right? We're not sure exactly how yet, but we know it's going to happen. Um, they are going to use uh, Mariana to get what she wants, but also to get what we want. And Isabella is going to be saved. Win-win. Okay? So then we move into Act 3, Scene 2. And, you know, there's a few things that happen in here. Lucio comes back in again. Uh, yet again, he does make himself look very stupid. Uh, and then Aeschylus uh, is talking to the Duke about the Duke. It's it's a very interesting scene. Uh, and then the Duke has a monologue at the end of the scene. And the question that I pose is, well, what happens uh, in that monologue? And what does it tell us? So let's see how Lucio makes himself look stupid. Well, in this particular scene, he can't seem to figure out the Duke dressed as a friar's kind of angle, okay? And that could be because he's in disguise, right? So initially, when the when uh, Lucio is talking to the Duke, he praises Angelo's governing style. He says, Lord Angelo dukes it well in the Duke's absence. He puts transgression to it. So he's saying, Angelo's stamping out people doing these misdeeds. Right. And so he's he's praising him. But then when the Duke says, yeah, Angelo's doing a good job, you know, he says they say this Angelo was not made by man and woman after this downright way of creation. Right? He's saying Angelo's not quite human. Right. So now Lucio has taken it kind of in a weird direction. You know, he's saying that Angelo is so moral uh, that he's just not quite human. He's got ice in his veins. He. Um, you know, it, it, he he's just praising Angelo in all these over-the-top ways that are also really absurd. And then he becomes incredulous about Claudio's punishment. He says, why, what a ruthless thing is this in him for the rebellion of a codpiece to take away the life of a man? Well, what this essentially means is that what he does in bed, right, the rebellion of a codpiece is... Um, you know, sort of what that essentially means is that he has acted upon the uh, the impulses that he has um, to take away the life of a man, right? He does this action and then it totally changes everything. His entire life changes. Uh, he's going to be put to death. And how ridiculous is that? Um, he even starts talking about the Duke, saying that uh, his use was to put a ducat in her clactish the Duke has crotchets in him. He would be a drunk too. Let me inform you. He's just talking and he's just saying things, right? Are these things that that Lucio knows? Uh, no. Does Lucio pretend that he knows them? Yeah. He's basically saying, you know, the Duke is a big guy for vices. He has a lot of them. He likes women. He likes drinking. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you about the Duke. Right, that is essentially what Lucio is doing here. And then he tells the, the Duke, right, who's still dressed up, so Lucio doesn't realize that it's him, that the Duke himself is a very superficial, ignorant, and unweighing fellow. So as the Duke is sitting here listening to all of this, you know, at first he's like, okay, I kind of thought Lucio was an idiot before. Uh, and then he's like, well, you know, I mean, he's praising Angelo, still an idiot, but, you know, he doesn't know that Angelo's doing this weird stuff. And then he's like, okay, so now he's criticizing Angelo when he was just praising him. And then now he's talking smack about me, the Duke, to me? How stupid is this guy, right? Of course, Lucio couldn't possibly know that the Duke is who he is, right? Because he's dressed up as a friar. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting to watch Lucio's arguments change and then to watch him fall victim to his own need to constantly fill silence, right? That's essentially what traps him. So the Duke gets 
you know, a little bit offended and goes and talks to Aeschylus, right? He's still dressed as a friar. Aeschylus doesn't realize this is him. And remember, Aeschylus is the Duke's most trusted advisor. So how he doesn't recognize that the Duke is the Duke while he's dressed up, that's another story entirely. I We're just going to roll with it, okay? Um, and Aeschylus tells the Duke, above all other strifes, the Duke is contented especially to know himself. So he's saying, you know, the Duke just, he kind of keeps to his own, right? So he essentially, Aeschylus is basically telling the Duke as a friar that, the Duke is not the things that Lucio just said that he was. And this sort of validates how the Duke feels about himself. Uh, and then, you know, he, he keeps pressing a little bit, the Duke. And Aeschylus tells him that the Duke is a gentleman of all temperance, right? And this, again, uh, you know, works against what Lucio has said and validates the Duke's idea of himself. But you know, it's to Aeschylus's credit that he doesn't do what Lucio does and just keep on and on and on and on talking about uh, the Duke, right? He quickly shifts the topic back to Claudio. He's like, the matter at hand is Claudio. And so he talks to the Duke as the friar and is like, have you prepared him for death? Have you given him his last rites? Um, you know, and so we see that Aeschylus is that, that sort of wise leader that you know, the Duke needs to use for advice uh, that Angelo chooses to reject, right? He doesn't listen to what Aeschylus is saying, and Aeschylus isn't assertive enough to tell Angelo that he's being stupid because Aeschylus respects the roles that are provided for him, okay? So then we come to the Duke's monologue at the end of the scene. What does that tell the reader? Well, it, the Duke is reflecting on what he's learned as he observes what's going on around him. And so he reaffirms that mercy and justice go hand in hand. He says, we, meaning rulers, who hold the sword of heaven will bear, should be as holy as severe, pattern in himself to know, grace to stand, and virtue go. Right? He's saying, you know, we who are in charge need to use that power in a positive way. Okay? That's essentially it. He's saying life is not black and white. Life happens in the gray area, and we need to recognize that. And so we see that the Duke himself is, is gaining more wisdom here. Uh, he also recognizes that those in power, like Angelo, uh, are not above the law. He says, more nor less to others paying than by self-offenses weighing, shame to him whose cruel striking kills for faults of his own liking. Right? How dare Angelo try to kill Claudio for the same thing that Angelo is asking Isabella for. How dare he? Okay, he's saying no one is above the law. Everyone follows it. I can't, as a ruler, go out and kill someone for the same action that I am committing. And then we see that realization that Angelo is just not cutting it. He says, oh, what may man within him hide, though angel on the outward side? He's saying, wow, Angelo talked a good game here. He really did. He had me snowed, right? He seemed like a good man. He seemed temperate. He seemed wise. He seemed just. And you know what? He's none of those things, right? So we see self-reflection uh, in this. And then we also see the Duke telling the reader that Angelo and Mariana are going to be together and it'll right Angelo's past wrongdoings. When I say right his wrongdoings, I mean, you know, it will, it will make sure that justice comes down upon him. And he says, with Angelo tonight shall lie his old betrothed but despised. So disguise shall by the disguised pay with falsehood, false exacting and perform an old contracting. So he's saying, you know what? Mariana is going to sleep with Angelo tonight. He's not going to know. And this, this trick is going to um, bring to light this old marriage contract that they have. Uh, and it'll be under that marriage contract that this action is committed. So then we move on to Act 4. Act 4 moves pretty quickly. There's a bunch of scenes, but they're all fairly short. So we see in Act 4, Scene 1, the Duke is speaking to Mariana. We find out how much Angelo wants to uh, <clears throat> meet with Isabella, 
Moriana and Isabella speak about the plan, right? That's what happens. Act four, scene two, the reader meets some of the people working in the prison and they hear about Barnardine, right? We meet, we don't meet him yet, but we hear about him. And then act four, scene three, the reader meets Barnardine and Lucio again puts his foot in his mouth. Act four, scene four, Angelo tells us what he feels about his interaction with Isabella, um, Mariana in reality, but he doesn't know. And act four, scene five, where the Duke announces his return to Vienna. Then act four, scene six, when Isabella and Mariana discuss Mariana's meeting with Angelo, and they hear that the Duke will return. So let's do this. Act four, scene one. What do we find out about Angelo when the Duke is speaking to Isabella? How does the Duke act during the meeting between Isabella and Mariana? And how does the Duke justify uh, this action from Mariana? How does he justify Mariana sleeping with Angelo? Well, <clears throat> the things that we find out about Angelo when the Duke is speaking to Isabella, uh, they're pretty straightforward, right? Angelo's super excited to sleep with Isabella, okay? He shows her the way to the place where they're supposed to meet twice. That's how excited he is to sleep with her, okay? He not only walks her there one time, but he walks her there uh, another time after that. And it's to the point where Isabella is able to lay out the directions to get to the place where she's supposed to meet Angelo kind of without batting an eye, right? It's pretty direct, straightforward. She just knows exactly where she's supposed to be. Uh, and that's because he's shown her multiple times, right? So we know that you know, whatever conflict Angelo might be feeling, uh, it's not really uh, as much of a big deal to him as the fact that he really wants to sleep with Isabella. So how does the Duke act during this meeting between Isabella and Mariana? Well, the Duke acts as a facilitator, okay? Remember, he's still acting as the friar. He's telling Mariana, you know, I pray you be acquainted with this maid, with Isabella, she comes to do you good, okay? And she makes sure that Mariana respects him. He says, um, you know, she, he asks her, she says that she does, but she doesn't respect him because she's never met him before. Uh, she, has, she respects his role as a friar. Some ethical issues, yeah, they're still happening, okay? Um, but he entreats her, Take then this your companion by the hand who hath a story ready for your ear. So he's saying, you know, with the power that's vested in him by his role as a friar, he's saying, listen to Isabella. She has something to tell you, right? And Mariana, respecting his role, says, all right, yeah, sounds good. I'll listen, okay? Uh, and then after Isabella tells Mariana the plan, the Duke tells uh, Isabella and Mariana tells them both that it is not his consent to commit the act, but his entreaty to. So as a friar, he's, he's saying that he's not just allowing it. He's actually asking for them to, to kind of carry out this plan and for Mariana to sleep with Angelo to let Isabella off the hook. Okay. Is that a little weird as a friar? Yeah, I'd probably say so. Okay. Um, but then he justifies it, right? He says, um, you know, he is your husband, he being Angelo, he is your husband on a pre-contract. To bring you thus together, tis no sin. Interesting. The man who's not a friar, but who is dressing and acting like a friar, tells the woman that she, that is going to sleep with her ex fiance that sleeping together is not a sin, when someone who just slept with their fiance, current fiance, mind you, is being hanged or beheaded for this particular act. Huh. There's a lot of twists and turns on that logic there. Um, so complicated? Heck yes. Entertaining? Also yes. So act four, scene two. Okay, what action takes place off stage between Acts, uh, Act 4, Scene 1 and Act 4, Scene 2? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, we meet, we, or we find out about Barnardine. Um, we find out if Angelo actually does pardon Claudio. What do you think? Do you think he does? We'll see. 
Uh, and then what does the Duke, still dressed as the friar, ask of the provost? Well, let's find out. So what action takes place off stage? Well, Angelo and Mariana sleep together, but Angelo thinks Mariana is Isabella. Complicated? Oh my goodness, yes. Okay, remember that this might sound weird, but it's outside in the dark, in the middle of the night, okay? Um, you know, they're meeting in secret. They're not, you know, Angelo's not really the kind of guy to, uh, that seems like he would be super attentive, you know what I'm saying? Um, so in the dark, Isabella, in air quotes, right, could actually be anyone. So she also has told Mariana to tell, uh, to say, uh, remember now my brother as she was leaving. And that's the only, um, verbal interaction that, uh, Mariana and Angelo appear to have in this particular, uh, meeting, right? So, you know, that kind of says a lot about Angelo too, but I'm not going to get into that, right? Um, so we know that they've slept together now, Angelo and Mariana. And then we find out about Barnardine, right? It kind of shifts. We're back in the prison. We find out that Barnardine is Claudio's fellow prisoner who's also set to die the next morning, okay? Um, but unlike Claudio, Barnardine doesn't really care, okay? Uh, even though he's been told he's going to die, he's as fast locked up in sleep as guiltless labor when it lies starkly on the traveler's bones, he will not wake. He's passed out. Barnardine's just chilling. He doesn't want to engage with this society at all. He's just sleeping it off, and then he's fine. Now, we do also find out that Barnardine has been imprisoned for nine years, uh, and that's because his friends still wrought reprieves for him, and indeed his fact till now in the government of Lord Angelo came not to undoubtful proof. Spoiler alert, that undoubtful proof is the exact same evidence that the Duke discounted previously. Okay, so that's the same evidence that they decided that he was not uh, someone who should be uh, killed until all the evidence is in. But Angelo, being Angelo, says, ah, let's clear out the prison. Okay, so just keep Barnardine in mind because we see him again and he's fun. So does Angelo pardon Claudio like he says? No, no, of course not. Right, he sends a letter to the provost that says, whatsoever you may hear to the contrary, let Claudio be executed by four of the clock and in the afternoon, Barnardine, for my better satisfaction, let me have Claudio's head sent to me by five. Let this be duly performed with a thought that more depends on it than we must yet deliver. Thus fail not to do your office as you will answer it at your peril. Oh my goodness, Angelo. This is a head and hands moment, okay? So he says, okay, so, Instead of pardoning Claudio, like, like was the deal, what he decides to do is actually push up the time of his execution, right? Claudio is now going to be beheaded uh, by four o'clock in the morning. Barnardine will be beheaded at the normal time in the afternoon. And, um, you know, he says, let me just make sure you do it. Send me Claudio's head. What? By five. By five? Right? It's it's just absurd. He wants to see Claudio's head within an hour of him being beheaded. Okay? And he actually follows it up by saying, like, there's more to this than meets the eye, so don't mess around. No matter what you hear, do this. Make sure Claudio dies. Wow. Angelo is... <sighs> He's some guy, isn't he? He really is. He's really showing his true colors here, right? Because not only does he uh, manipulate Isabella, he actually, as far as he knows, he sleeps with her. He ruins her chance at becoming a nun. He knows this. Um, he also has promised her to that that this action that she she is supposedly committing will save her brother. Well, he goes against that, doesn't he? Um, and, you know, he's just putting safeguards in place to make sure this happens. Gosh, I have a few words for Angelo, I have to tell you. Um, but let's move on. Okay, so what does the Duke, after the provost gets this letter, ask of the provost? Remember, the Duke is still dressed as the friar. Well, 
he says, you know what, I've got another plan. Not another one for the provost, but his other plan was about Isabella and Mariana. Now he's his, his scheming mind is working, and he's saying, shave Barnardine's head and tie the beard and say it was the desire of the penitent to be so bared before his death. He goes, okay, let's dress up Barnardine, uh, and, and maybe Angelo won't realize that it's a different person. Okay, we'll kill Barnardine instead of killing Claudio. Is that ethical? Definitely not. But the Duke already has some questionable ethics. And since this request goes against Angelo's specific instructions, right, the Duke recognizes that his disguise uh, isn't enough to, um, you know, to make the provost believe that this this message is from the duke. So he actually provides the uh, provides the provost with instructions with the duke's um, seal from his signet ring. Okay, uh, and so once the um, the provost sees this, he's thinking, well, let's see, who's more important? Uh, in the grand scheme of things, the duke or the acting duke. So, of course, the provost is going to go with the duke's instructions, right? Seems logical. You go for the boss, right? The dude that's actually in charge and not the interim boss. So then we move on to Act 4, Scene 3. We find out some more stuff about Barnardine, who is so great, by the way. I love Barnardine. He cracks me up. Uh, and he, we find out a little bit more about Vienna's legal system through Barnardine's reactions. Um, we also find out something that takes place that changes the plan, right, to bring Angelo Barnardine's head. So that, that's off the table now. We have a new thing going. Um, and the Duke decides to hide something from Isabella. So we'll talk about what that is. And then about the Duke's plan to return. So what do we find out about Barnardine, and what does this say about justice in Vienna? Well, Barnardine's a drunk who hangs out in the prison. He probably plays cards with the guards. Um, he just, you know, he, he just is one of the guys there, essentially. Um, when the executioner calls him to be hanged, he says, A pox of your throats. Who makes that noise there? What are you? He is hungover as anything. He does not want to be woken up. He's not about to be killed today, okay? Uh, Pompey reiterates that Barnardine is to be hanged, and Barnardine just says, away, you rogue, away, I am sleepy. He's too sleepy to die, right? Court ordered death. He's too sleepy. Interesting. But we also do find that, you know, the, the jailers have been joking with him for the last nine years that he's meant to be dying today. Right. And so at this point, Barnardine's just like, you know what? Whatever. This isn't going to happen because it never happens. Right. Um, and then the Duke offers Barnardine his last rites. Right. As a friar. And the and Barnardine actually says, friar, not I. I've been drinking hard all night and I have more time to prepare me or I will have more time to prepare me or they shall beat out my brains with billets. I will not consent to die this day, that's certain. Oh my goodness, Barnardine. So Barnardine essentially is saying, you know what, I'm not feeling it today. I will not consent to death uh, because I'm pretty hungover. I just am not feeling it. I'm not talking to this friar here. I'm not going to die today. And... As a reader, you might just be sitting here like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that Barnardine is in control of his own legally mandated death. Well, that's a good position to hold because it's weird, right? Um, but we see that the way that Barnardine is manipulating the legal system and the way that he has such control over all of these situations, uh, it tells us that the legal system and justice in general in Vienna has been really strange for a really long time. It's been ineffective. It's uh, just something that is not, uh, it's, it's not a good way uh, to run a, a city, right? Um, leaving the prisoners in charge of their prison sentence, you know, that never sounds like a great idea, does it? So, you know, we find out a little bit more uh, about how things are run in the Duke's Vienna, 
okay? Angelo's making stuff happen. He says, Barnardine, you're going to die tomorrow. And the provost says, okay, Barnardine's going to die tomorrow. When the Duke's in charge, there's a lot, it's a lot more wishy-washy, right? Yeah, yeah, you'll die, you'll die. Doesn't die. Yeah, it's going to happen. Doesn't happen. Right. So we find out a little bit more about how things now are different from how things have been. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what takes place that alters the plan to bring Angelo Barnardine's head? Right. That was an awesome plan. Kind of eye roll there because, uh, no, not so awesome. Um, but we find out that th uh, there's a pirate named Ragazine who dies. OK. Uh, here in the prison, Father, there died this morning of a cruel fever, one ragazine, a most notorious pirate, a man of Claudio's years, his beard, his and, and head just of his color. What if we do omit Barnardine till he were well inclined, and satisfy the deputy with the vis visage of ragazine, more like to Claudio? Oh my goodness, I have this great idea. So, this pirate died. Right, he kind of looks like Claudio, at least a lot more like Claudio than Barnardine. And you know, why don't we give Barnardine some time so that he can kind of come to terms with the idea that he's going to die, um, and instead use Ragazine's head because now we don't have to kill anybody. Um, and you know what? He's going to look a heck of a lot more like Claudio. Oh my goodness, this whole thing is just absurdly strange, isn't it? But you know what? Let's see if it works. So the Duke decides to hide something from Isabella. He doesn't tell her that her brother is not dead. In fact, uh, he tells her Angelo hath released him, Isabel, from the world. His head is off and sent to Angelo. So he tells her that Claudio is dead. Right, so now she starts mourning her brother. Um, is there a reason that the Duke does this? Absolutely. Right? The Duke wants Isabella to be as persuasive as possible. She wants her to be advocating for uh, Angelo's punishment. right? But is it fair to Isabella, who he's been in league with from the beginning, uh, to all of a sudden turn the tables and make her part of another scheme that she's not aware of? Well, the Duke's not really about fairness, is he? Okay? Um, you know, so, so, yeah, he just doesn't tell her her brother is not not dead. Let's her think he is. And that's some messed up stuff. So then we find that the Duke plans to return to Vienna tomorrow morning. Oh my goodness, the timing is perfect, right? Because that, you know, uh, Angelo's going to get Ragazine's head. Ragazine's head's going to, you know, seem like it's Claudio's head. And then all this is going to happen and the Duke's going to come back, right? But the Duke already knows that all this happened. So oh my goodness, what's going to happen when the Duke actually comes back? Well, the Duke in disguise tells Isabella, the Duke comes home tomorrow. Nay, dry your eyes. One of our convent and his confessor gives me this insistence. Already he hath carried notice to Aeschylus and Angelo, who do prepare to meet him at the gates, there to give up their power. Okay, so the Duke is saying, the Duke's coming back tomorrow, and you're going to have your shot at, you know, redeeming your brother's name and uh, punishing Angelo, okay? So he's saying, you know, I know this from a good friend, right? He's using Father Peter here. Uh, he says, I know this from a good friend. He's a friar too, so he's trustworthy, wink. Um, and he says that Friar Peter's already told Aeschylus and Angelo that they're going to meet the Duke at the gates, right? So this isn't going to be uh, this isn't going to be a private return like he left, right? This is going to be a very public event. In fact, he says, you know, we got to get the trumpets out. You know, he's making it a big to do. Essentially, he's making it a show, okay? So that everyone pays attention. So then we have Act 4, Scene 4. We see a little bit about how Angelo feels about his interaction with Isabella. Even though we know it wasn't Isabella, he still thinks it was, right? So he feels some guilt. He says, this deed unshapes me quite, makes me unpregnant and dull to all proceedings, a deflowered maid and by an eminent body that enforced the law against it, right? He realizes that he's a hypocrite. But, but, 
at the same time, he's confident that he's safe here. He says, my authority bears of a credent bulk that no particular scandal once can touch. He goes, you know what? They know what I'm doing here. The Duke knows me as a human, and they'll never believe it. I'm going to get away with it. No one will know of my hypocrisy, even if she tells them. Wow, Angelo. Wow. Wow. Big eye roll. Okay. So then we move into Act 4, Scene 5. How does the Duke plan to return to Vienna? Well, he wants to, like I said before, make a very public return. He asks Friar Peter to give the notice that he's returning to town to Valencius, Roland, and to Crassus, and bid them bring the trumpets to the gate. Right? He's saying, bring crowds, bring trumpets. I want this to be a big, essentially, parade. Okay? Um, so, you know, he's getting uh, the, the townspeople all jazzed up about this. Okay, and why would he want to do that? Spectacle. Okay, then we see Act 4, Scene 6. There's a few things that happen in here. So we see Mariana and Isabella's reaction to Mariana's interaction with Angelo. And we also find out where Mariana and Isabella stand at the Duke's reception. That might not seem important, but I promise you, it is. So... Mariana and Isabella discuss how they're going to confront Angelo publicly in front of the Duke, okay? Isabella is still hung up on truths and untruths. She says, I would say the truth, but to accuse him so, that is your part. Yet I am advised to, to do it. He says to veil full purpose. All right, so Friar, uh, Friar Lodovic, right, the Duke, tells Isabella that she's the one who's got to publicly confront Angelo and say that he broke their, their compact. So that doesn't sit well with Isabella, who is not a liar, right? She is someone who values truth, someone who values mercy, someone who values justice. And while she might get the justice, she doesn't get the mercy or the truth here, okay? So... You know, we kind of know that she's a little bit bummed out about how this is going to happen, um, but she knows that she has to do it like this. The plan makes sense. And so where do they stand at the Duke's reception? Well, Friar Peter comes in and he's like, hey, I found you a good spot. So he found them a stand most fit where they may have such vantage on the Duke, he shall not pass you. Okay, basically, he puts them in a place and this is the, the Duke dressed as the friar asks Friar Peter to put them in this place, right? So the Duke is orchestrating this whole thing, this whole interaction that will come. And he says, make sure they get a good spot because I want to hear their story and I want everyone else to hear it too. All right, you guys, so that's Act 3 and 4. We've got Act 5 coming up next week. Get excited about it. Act 5 is, it's a whirlwind. So get ready, and I will see you then.